You know, normally when I begin this podcast on Friday, I go over what happened on Raw, SmackDown, NXT, and if 205 Live has a match of the year candidate, we'll talk about that. It's SummerSlam season. We are three and a half weeks away from SummerSlam. And I have absolutely zero interest in anything coming out of Monday Night Raw. That's an issue. That is a very big issue, and I know I am not the only one who feels that way. WWE, for the entirety of 2018, have focused Monday Night Raw on the absence of Brock Lesnar. For the entirety of 2018, WWE has focused on Roman Reigns being the superhero in all of this, standing up for what is right. And now with the inclusion of Bobby Lashley, their focus is on Bobby Lashley, and the fans have no interest in Bobby Lashley. Monday Night Raw seen yet again the same issue. Afraid to move away from their formulaic ways, WWE continues to push Roman Reigns and Bobby Lashley When in fact, the fans and the people watching at home don't have any interest in these two guys. I mentioned on my Monday Night Raw review, and a lot of people were wondering, why did these two guys fight at Extreme Rules if this was only the outcome that we were going to get anyway? Why didn't they make that the number one contender match at Extreme Rules? Well, to be honest with you, WWE gave themselves an easy out. They didn't make the match at Extreme Rules for anything. It was basically for quote-unquote bragging rights. Lashley got a win over Roman Reigns. I guess they wanted him to look dominant just in case they wanted to book a rematch on the road to SummerSlam, and that is exactly what they did. They booked a rematch on the road to SummerSlam, and now, being that they put these two guys through the gauntlet, per se, these two triple threat matches in which Reigns and Lashley both won their triple threat matches, respectively. Now they have a reason to fight for the number one contenders to the Universal Championship. I doubt WWE even came up with this idea or had it planned before the Extreme Rules show. Ideas like that, to me, just based on what I've seen with WWE Creative, this idea was probably brought to the table in the mere hours right after Extreme Rules went off the air. This was probably materialized on the plane to Buffalo for Monday Night Raw. Or when they woke up, they pieced together segment by segment for Monday Night Raw with no plans in, in, in place or in mind. WWE continues to push guys that we don't have any interest in. Like, I don't understand WWE's logic. You're going to put Seth Rollins, Finn Balor, Drew McIntyre, and Elias... In those triple threat matches, and everybody watching would much rather have one of those guys win it over who actually won the match. I didn't like the idea of the triple threat matches at all. WWE's formulaic ways just gave us another boring Monday Night Raw. They are afraid to change. They are afraid to try something new. It's like the fucking bum who goes to my bar on Bleecker Street In the village area of New York, fucking bars got 500 bottles of beer. This is WWE Creative. This is the guy that I see walking into my bar. The fucking bum. 500 bottles on the menu. Categorized by country in alphabetical order. He sits down at the bar. Yeah, can I get a uh, Budweiser? I look over at him. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? The fuck are you doing here? Go to the fucking hole in the wall. You know, down the street, that sells three beers. Corona, Heineken, and Budweiser. You're going to come to my bar and got a fucking Budweiser? Meanwhile, I'm over there sitting next to him drinking a beer with 14% alcohol from some unknown fucking country that you never even heard of. That is WWE Monday Night Raw in a nutshell. They're the bum that goes to my bar with 500 bottles in the back on the menu... And they're drinking a fucking Budweiser. I didn't like the way 
they went about Monday Night Raw at all. You know, I don't want to repeat myself. And, you know, to some it may make sense, to some it may not make sense. The only thing that doesn't make sense if WWE went about having a tournament on Monday Night Raw is the fact that it would probably take up too much time. It would probably take away valuable television time to develop some storylines for everybody else leading into SummerSlam. Like, we don't, we don't have any idea what anybody's doing at SummerSlam. It's honestly going to be booked on the fly. SummerSlam for a third year in a row is going to be booked on the fly. And if it's anything like the last two SummerSlams, we can expect yet another summer scam. Talk about the biggest party of the summer. This may be the lamest party of the summer. Again, for a third year in a row. Instead of doing the triple threat matches, WWE could have easily set forth a tournament. Easily. They could have put the same guys in there. They could have featured a Bobby Roode and a Dolph Ziggler who fought on Monday Night Raw to fucking library silence. That is a damn shame. Could have had an eight-man tournament. You could have put the brackets together that maybe brought Ziggler and McIntyre together in the same bracket. Or Rollins and Ziggler in a rematch. Can you imagine a tournament to move on to the next round? Or a match between those two guys to move on to the next round? Or possibly get into the SummerSlam main event? Dolph Ziggler and Seth Rollins going back and forth for 30 fucking minutes on Monday Night Raw to see who goes on to the next round or to see who goes on to the main event of SummerSlam. You mean to tell me that that wouldn't be more interesting than what we got on Monday Night Raw? You know? Reigns and Rollins could eventually meet in the tournament. Drew McIntyre and Roman Reigns in a one-on-one match. Drew McIntyre, Bobby Lashley, Drew McIntyre, Seth Rollins. Elias could have gotten another match with Seth Rollins. Elias versus Bobby Lashley. Elias versus Roman Reigns. You know, Bobby Roode versus Drew McIntyre, both XTNA guys. It could have been great. It could have been great. Or Finn Balor, you know? Finn Balor versus Roman, Finn Balor versus Drew McIntyre one-on-one. I much rather see one-on-one in a tournament aspect because that type of environment would actually be beneficial to all. Gives guys big wins. It's unpredictable. The way WWE sets these triple threat matches out, it's like they told you who was going to win those triple threat matches before we each, before we actually seen them take place. Oh, look, Roman's in a separate one and Bobby Lashley's in a separate one. Who's going to win? As soon as Roman won, we all knew Bobby Lashley was going to win. I'm not on WWE Creative. Everything that I say, you know, it means nothing. It really means nothing to anybody. I just want WWE to get away from the formulaic aspect of Monday Night Raw, step outside their bubble, their comfort zone, and do something fucking different. All we want is something different. And I think the majority of the fans want something different too, being that they suffered the lowest viewership in 25 years. And yes, Reigns has every bit to do with that. Lashley too. He hasn't actually been setting the world on fire since his return. He's been putting people to sleep, but not setting the world on fire on Monday night. Roman Reigns, don't get me started. We all know about him. Guy loses, 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 and then WWE presents him with a- another opportunity. At every fucking drop of a dime, every whim. Never seen so many opportunities for a fucking loser. Oh, JD, it's fake, man. But you're making me feel like an idiot. I never seen a loser get so many fucking opportunities. And I mentioned this on Monday Night Raw Review. Nobody else mentioned it anywhere else. Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins, if you were going to have him lose at Extreme Rules and then have him turn around 24 hours later and lose in the main event in a triple threat match, how does that make him look? How does that make him look? If you had no plan to put Seth Rollins anywhere near the main event, why give him a week off from unfinished business with Dolph Ziggler? I guarantee you, WWE is going to put Seth Rollins back with Dolph Ziggler on Monday Night Raw. Why didn't that continue going into Raw? Why did Rollins have to suffer another loss? He didn't take the pin, but he still lost. I 
I don't understand WWE's logic with any of this. It's, it's just some of the most uninteresting stuff you could possibly ever write and pen going into SummerSlam. Nobody wants this shit. This has been the year of waiting and waiting and waiting and then the year of Roman Reigns. When are they going to do it? At this point, I don't even think it's going to happen. Even in August. WWE is setting themselves up for failure. They are wasting our time pushing Roman Reigns and Bobby Lashley. The title does not go through those two. The title only goes through one man right now. And this is what we're going to talk about at the beginning of this show. I mentioned this on Monday Night Raw Review, and I know for a fact I would be shocked if this does not happen. I would be shocked if this does not happen. According to sources, a triple threat match for the Universal Championship is planned for SummerSlam. Triple threat? You ain't getting no fucking triple threat. This is the year of multi-man matches. Triple threat? I'll do you one better. A fatal four-way is going to happen at SummerSlam because WWE doesn't know any better. The WWE doesn't know any better. JD, how could you say there's going to be a fatal four-way? Well, you look at this. Brock Lesnar isn't going to show his face until SummerSlam. He's the Universal Champion. He's got a spot in the main event. Roman Reigns? Where is he going? Where is he going to be on the SummerSlam card? He isn't going to be feuding with anybody else. If anybody, he's going to be feuding with Lashley again. And there's not going to be a reason for a third match with Bobby Lashley. Roman's going to be in the main event. Bobby Lashley, he's got no one else to feud with. What are you going to do with him going into SummerSlam? He'll be in the main event. I would be absolutely shocked if this last piece to the puzzle does not happen. Braun Strowman. Braun Strowman is the Money in the Bank briefcase owner. Braun Strowman is not the type of guy, and I... WWE, for one, cannot keep Braun Strowman off the SummerSlam card because it's going to make everything that much more predictable. WWE should have Braun Strowman come out on Monday night, fuck shit up, give me the Strowman of old, not for this comedy shit with Kevin Owens, Braun Strowman should come out on Monday Night Raw and dish just destroy both Roman Reigns and Bobby Lashley. He needs to disrupt whatever WWE has planned. Whatever the case may be. I don't know if he causes a no contest. I don't know if Reigns does beat Lashley and then Lashley in the last two weeks of the build somehow gets himself into the main event. You know? I don't know how they find themselves an out. He could, he could lobby to WWE management. Listen, Roman Reigns, I beat him in Extreme Rules. Why do I have to go through him again? Because you put me in this bullshit situation. He could lobby for a, a match at SummerSlam for the Universal Championship. I just beat Reigns. I beat him in Extreme Rules. Now you're telling me that all because Reigns beat me and we're even, that he gets in the main event and I don't? I could beat Reigns. I could beat Lesnar. Put me in that match. I don't know what they do, how they figure that one out. But I'm going with the Braun Strowman just disrupting everything that they have planned. And he puts himself in the match at SummerSlam. It's going to be a triple threat match according to sources. But Braun Strowman is not the type of guy that's going to find an opportune moment and cash in when one guy is weak. Or the match was over and one guy's bloodied and he's going to take advantage of fresh Braun Strowman comes out and catches the money in the bank. No, that's not, that doesn't fit Braun Strowman's criteria. Braun Strowman can show up on any show, on any night, demand what he wants, and he's going to get it. Are you going to tell him no? You cannot keep Braun Strowman off of SummerSlam's card. WWE needs to have Braun Strowman in the highlights. They need to have him in the spotlight. They need to have him on the poster, on the card, Advertise for a match. This will be a fatal four-way. Just like we got when Lesnar, Joe, Reigns, and Strowman did their fatal four-way at SummerSlam just a year ago. This is what's going to happen. This is my prediction. Braun Strowman is not going to find an opportune moment to cash in on a, 
a downed Reigns or a downed Lashley or a downed Lesnar. It's going to be, listen, I don't give a fuck what's going on here. I'm cashing in. He's the monster. He's going to cash in admirably, and he's going to put himself into this mix. It's the only thing that makes sense. I don't see anything else besides that happening. Now, the Lesnar saga took another twist on Sunday night. And Raw General Manager Kurt Angle that, uh, that he did at Extreme Rules with the announcement that he had set forth was that if the Beast didn't turn up on Monday Night Raw, he would be stripped of the Universal Championship. Now, that's what the fans want at this point as everybody is in the same boat. They want the title on Monday Night Raw. They want it off Lesnar. Because he's not doing anything, and the title is absolutely fucking worthless at this point. Now, Heyman was on Raw. Heyman's appearance was more than enough. Six superstars, the ones that I just mentioned, came down, all lobbied for a match, and they were put in two triple threat matches separately. The winners of those two triple threat matches, which ended up being Reigns and Lashley, would fight next week on Raw for the number one contender for the Universal Championship at SummerSlam. So we had Reigns, Lashley, McIntyre, Ballard, Elias, Rollins. They were all battling to determine which one would step up to the plate and battle Brock Lesnar in Brooklyn for the Universal Championship. Now, considering fans watched Lashley and Reigns at Extreme Rules and Lashley beat Reigns, it's easy to understand why many on social media weren't too pleased with having to watch this match again next week. But like I said, WWE... They did not announce the match at Extreme Rules to be for anything. I honestly think WWE gave Lashley a win because it's all going to tie into some sort of storyline moving forward. WWE wanted Lashley to get the win over Reigns. They wanted to build sympathy for Reigns. And it wasn't, like I said, for anything. So WWE gave themselves an easy out. They put this match again on next week, and now it's for the number one contender. So... Everybody does have a, a, a right to complain. And the only reason why they're complaining is because we don't want to see these two guys in this position. It's not, the fa- it's not the fact that the fans are complaining, oh, Lashley beat Reigns, why do we have to see this again? It's the fact that they don't want to see it, period. They don't want to see these two guys where they are right now. We want to see one man. And that is Seth Rollins. Finn Balor even has more of a, a, of a story. To lobby for a match, more so than Reigns and and Lashley. I don't understand this shit. How is anybody excited to see Lashley and Reigns again? That's where the fucking problem stems. This is where the complaints are coming from. Now, while the Extreme Rules match can be deemed meaningless at this point, which it was, in in WWE's eyes, they needed to get Lashley a big win Because like I said, I think it's going to tie into storylines. If it takes Lashley out of title contention, Wrestling Inc. has revealed that there may have been some internal rumors regarding the match Lesnar could be featured in at SummerSlam. Now, according to the source, one rumor is claiming that Lesnar could end up defending his title against Lashley and Reigns in a triple threat match. If it is a rumor... If this rumor, which comes to fruition, it's something the fans on Twitter also believe could be the direction that they're going in, especially since it looks unlikely that Vince McMahon will stop the Reigns push and Lashley's win over Reigns at Extreme Rules has to be leading to a title match at some point. The expectation is that Lesnar will drop the Universal title at SummerSlam and a triple threat does act like the perfect match for him to remain looking strong ahead of his potential exit. It won't be a huge surprise if this is the direction WWE decides to go, and they love a finish featuring plenty of craziness. While it also seems highly unlikely that either man will be thrown into a different feud so soon ahead of SummerSlam. Exactly what I just said to you guys, and I said it on Monday Night Raw Review. And now the report that I just literally got minutes ago I hit record is saying the same thing. We've seen two triple threat matches already. We could be seeing another one with the title on the line. Although Braun Strowman is likely to be hovering around, keeping his eye on how everything unfolds 
regardless of what type of match it is. Braun Strowman is going to make this triple threat match that is rumored a fatal four-way. I don't know what happens at Monday Night Raw. I don't know what happens with Reigns and Lashley. If it ends in a no contest, if it ends in a double DQ, if it ends in a double countout, if it ends in a no contest because of Braun Strowman, or somebody, somebody interferes. I don't know who, but I don't know how WWE gets themselves out of this. If Reigns beats Lashley and we get Reigns and Lesnar, at least for a week, advertised as the main event for SummerSlam, how do you get Lashley in the main event of SummerSlam, and then what do you do with Strowman? Strowman, Strowman's the easy one. He could come out any week and say, listen, fuck everybody, I'm going to be in the main event because I got the briefcase. But how do you get Lashley in the main event of SummerSlam? Because we all know exactly what I said on Monday Night Raw is 100% factual. Reigns and Lashley have absolutely nothing going on going into SummerSlam. You know for a fact that they will be in the main event of SummerSlam. Just to see Lashley and Reigns mix it up, uh, Lashley and Lesnar rather, mix it up at SummerSlam is enough of a selling point to get Lashley in that match. Reigns is going to be there. Strowman is going to be there because he's got the briefcase. This is going to be a fatal four-way. Whether you like it or not, this is a fatal four-way. And the opportunity for WWE to do the right thing at SummerSlam with Braun Strowman is off the charts. They need to make Strowman the Universal Champion walking into Brooklyn on Monday. Or the Barclays Center on Monday. Enough of this Reign shit. Enough of this Lashley shit. Enough of this Lesnar shit. Ship him off to UFC. Goodbye. I don't want anything to do with you around the Universal Championship ever again. Or the WWE Championship. Or any championship in WWE for that matter. This title needs to be on Strowman. You wasted too much time with Strowman. It should have been done already. But WWE did not pull the trigger. Now you're pulling the trigger on Strowman. If you don't pull the trigger on Strowman right now, I don't, I'm not going to care. I don't think a lot of people are, are going to sit around and, and fucking care for Braun Strowman if he doesn't win the Universal Championship at, at SummerSlam. That's just my feeling on that. So that's what's happening on Raw. That's the big thing on Monday Night Raw. I don't know what else to tell you. On SmackDown Live... WWE apparently is going to set forth a championship match for the WWE Championship. According to Paige, she's going to announce who AJ Styles will be defending the WWE title against at SummerSlam. I I think all the rumors that have been talked about for weeks leading into next week are pointing to Samoa Joe, and I think that's going to be absolutely 100% true. The thing with that is, I don't think AJ Styles is losing the WWE Championship. Now... You're probably wondering why. JD, you've been lobbying for Samoa Joe championship reign for a long time. Yeah, I know. But that doesn't mean WWE is going to put the title on Joe just because the fans want it. WWE loves AJ Styles. WWE wants AJ Styles as its champion. I would not be surprised if AJ Styles is the WWE champion going into the Royal Rumble. Really? WWE has their new video game coming out. AJ Styles is the cover star. AJ Styles is going to be the WWE Champion going into the release of that game. That is my prediction on that. What good would AJ Styles be to the marketing team if he wasn't the WWE Champion? He's great on on his own without the title, but him being the WWE Champion, being the cover athlete for WW2K19, it's even more of an attracting uh, visual. So, Joe, again, may be shit out of luck. Wrong place at the wrong time. It may be a five-star match today. It may end up being one of the best matches of the year, but that doesn't mean Samoa Joe's going to be WWE Champion. We may be shit out of luck seeing Samoa Joe win the WWE Championship. Because if he doesn't win the championship, then all signs point to The Miz. Because right now, the way I see it on SmackDown Live, there isn't enough heels on SmackDown Live for AJ Styles to feud with. You got Joe, you got The Miz, you got Randy Orton. Outside that, who do you got? Nobody. That may be enough. That may just be enough to get AJ through the rest of the year. We'll get another couple of pay-per-views with Joe. Joe will fail. Then he can move on to Randy Orton. He could get through Randy Orton, and then he'll eventually be stopped by The Miz. Because that's where the money is right there. Miz and Styles. Miz taking the title off of Styles and then going into WrestleMania and Daniel Bryan will win the Royal Rumble? 
That's where the money is, people. That's where the money is. Speaking of Daniel Bryan, WWE seemingly planting seeds for Daniel Bryan and The Miz at SummerSlam. I know I'm not the only one who's thinking about Daniel Bryan and The Miz happening too soon at SummerSlam. But, I'm not really going to sit here and tell you I don't want to see it. I would much rather they save it. But if this is happening at SummerSlam, then this should be at least another chapter written in this feud with more to come. This is not the end-all, be-all. I doubt WWE, uh, I hope not, I'm keeping my fingers crossed here, I, I doubt WWE gives us Miz and Daniel Bryan and then ends it at SummerSlam. That would be absolutely fucking foolish. Uh, I think WWE knows, or has to know, or at least I hope they do, know that there's money in Daniel Bryan and The Miz going into WrestleMania. Simple. Daniel Bryan and The Miz for the WWE Championship at WrestleMania. WWE should have Daniel Bryan win the Royal Rumble, Miz beat AJ Styles at Royal Rumble for the WWE title, and then we can have the next chapter written for that. This is why I would have much rather given The Miz the Money in the Bank briefcase. This would have played into the entire storyline so perfectly. But, I don't know. That's what I would have did. Miz and Daniel Bryan going into WrestleMania with the WWE Championship on the line. That is a money main event for WrestleMania. So we'll see what happens with that. Andrade C. and Almas versus AJ Styles on SmackDown Live. I loved it. I love that Almas went from wrestling Sin Cara on SmackDown Live and then again at the Extreme Rules pre-show and then all of a sudden has AJ Styles thrown in his face in the opening match on SmackDown Live. Was it a great match? Yes. Was it a great sign of things to come? Absolutely. I didn't agree with the ending. I did not agree with the ending of that match. Now, Almas lost, but he lost in a way that really doesn't fit well with me. It doesn't sit well with me whatsoever. Almas immediately tapped out to the calf crusher. If WWE wanted to have Almas and Styles happen on SmackDown Live, uh, I think another ending could have definitely benefited both men. WWE, you know, with this announcement of AJ Styles' opponent, if it's going to be Samoa Joe, why not give Samoa Joe a reason to challenge for the WWE Championship? He hasn't been featured on SmackDown Live. He's been doing nothing. Why don't you have Joe attack Styles, cause a DQ, and just save the tap out? How does it make Almas look where he tapped out in the most anticlimactic way possible, in mere seconds, to AJ Styles. Then I gotta hear, oh, WWE gave you Almas and Styles, it was a good showcase match, and they don't really go into a reason as to why. Oh, don't complain about it. I didn't complain about it, I just complained about the ending. The guy has no momentum. The guy has zero momentum. This guy was the best thing in NXT outside Johnny Gargano, uh, as NXT champion, brought to the main roster way too fast, and I'm sitting around doing nothing. He hasn't competed on SmackDown Live since the middle of May. Then they wait for Sin Cara to be cleared from injury, or whatever the fucking reason was. A, a feud with Sin Cara that lasted two two weeks, and WWE expects the people to care about Almas. How is that treating a top guy in your company? Good. How is anybody sitting here agreeing with the ending on SmackDown Live? Instead of announcing, yes, Samoa Joe is the number one contender for the WWE Championship. Really? What the fuck has he done? What has he done to get a number one contender match? Or, or, or be the number one contender? Instead of announcing somebody for Styles, why don't you give Joe a reason to go out there and challenge for the WWE Championship? He's been bragging ever since he came to SmackDown Live that he's going to take down all of our idols and our heroes. There you go. And you get to save Almas in the process. How good does Almas look tapping out to AJ Styles in mere seconds? Yeah, it was a good showcase match, but he ended up being a loser. He ended up being a loser. I even have it in my notes. It was the first thing that I wrote down. Almas, you know, has no momentum going into this thing. And WWE, 
you know, to give him a string of momentum would have been the best thing for him. You know? The WWE Champion shouldn't be losing on TV, but that doesn't mean that Almas has to lose either. Neither of those men could afford a loss, but they ended up giving it to Almas anyway. You know? Uh, having Almas showcase against Styles is great, but with a guy who has been held off the roster for two months, for whatever reason, his momentum was killed. And now WWE has to work triple as hard to get people to care about Almas. It's ridiculous. My mindset going into this was, let's get Styles with a challenger for SummerSlam. If they announce a guy to challenge Styles at SummerSlam without a reason, I'm going to be fucking pissed. Because you just gave me an outcome that was completely unnecessary. Another thing that is unnecessary is WWE's treatment of Asuka. We didn't see Asuka on SmackDown Live. Now it's all about Becky Lynch, which makes me wonder what they're doing with Asuka. Is Asuka done moving on from Extreme Rules? Because there certainly was an opening for her to get another match, being that the shenanigans on Extreme Rules and James Ellsworth and Carmella basically doing absolutely nothing of value in that match should lead to another rematch. Now, WWE kept Asuka off TV, and now they're focusing on Becky Lynch, which I don't have a problem with. But with Becky Lynch, you know, it's kind of unfair of WWE to treat Asuka the way they have and push her to the side with such a huge gaping, you know, opening for another rematch with Carmella, and now you're going to move Becky Lynch into that spot. So what are we doing with Asuka? Is she done? <laughs> How do you fuck that up? Everybody's been complaining about Asuka on social media. WWE buried Asuka. WWE ruined Asuka. Of course they did. Of course they ruined Asuka. I don't know why, but maybe, maybe WWE does have a plan for Asuka. The way she attacked James Ellsworth and everybody else at Extreme Rules, maybe we get a heel Asuka. A new Asuka. A refreshed Asuka. Maybe she didn't catch on as a babyface. I don't know. Maybe WWE finds value in her better as a heel than a babyface. They got babyfaces on that roster. They got way too many babyfaces on that roster. They got Naomi, they got Becky, they got Charlotte. Maybe Asuka is better off as a heel. I don't know. Well, Becky Lynch, the time is now for Becky Lynch. SummerSlam is upon us. If you don't give Becky this title, I don't think Becky's ever going to get the title. Whatever WWE has planned is going to happen in the next four weeks. She's been on the best streak of her career since moving to the main roster. This is it. This is the best Becky has looked since winning the Women's Championship back in 2016. But it's tough to argue, you know, with, with Becky. Becky deserves it. It, it, it's it, it's so difficult to look at this and not feel for Asuka. Is Asuka done? She's been made to look like a fool time and time and time again. And you're not going to have Asuka come back and get revenge. It, it's almost as if WWE took whatever happened in NXT and made it a priority to fuck that up. And nobody knows why. I'm hoping they have a plan for Asuka. Asuka should have come in and be the most dominant female that this company has ever seen in the women's division. I got over the fact that Asuka lost her streak to Charlotte. I cannot sit here and get over the fact that WWE is not going to let Asuka get one over on Carmella. And what's going to happen when Charlotte comes back? Is Charlotte going to be the queen of SmackDown Live again? Are we headed towards Becky and Charlotte? I don't know. Again, where does Asuka fit into all this? Could we get Becky and Charlotte for the SmackDown Women's Championship? That's not going to bode well for Asuka. Because you know when Charlotte comes back, she's going to place herself right in front of Asuka. She's going to be vying for that Women's Championship. But a Charlotte-Asuka dynamic as heel Charlotte? Uh, heel Asuka, rather, against babyface Charlotte? Or babyface Becky versus heel Asuka? I don't know. I would much rather Charlotte come back as a heel. She's better as a heel. But I think she's been doing so much in the public eye that I don't think WWE's going to turn her heel at all. So Asuka may be the best fit for a heel right now. We'll see what happens. I don't know. 
I really don't understand what they're doing, but I, I can only hope for the best with Oscar. Other than that, man, SmackDown Live was a good show. Randy Orton proves to be, you know, you know, a, as a heel, absolutely fantastic. You know, we we seen Randy Orton come back to Stream Rules. He kicked Jeff Hardy in the balls below the belt. We all wondered what was going on. Obviously, they have some sort of history, and they're playing off that fact. Jeff Hardy won the United States Championship, and Randy Orton is back to claim his championship. Nakamura now. You know, they're not going to do one-on-one with Nakamura and Randy Orton. I'm assuming Jeff Hardy is going to be at SummerSlam. I'm assuming it will be a triple threat match. And that's my prediction on that. But Randy Orton, coming back the way he has in the last week, has been one of the most talked about things on SmackDown Live. One of the most talked about things in the WWE. Randy Orton as a heel is fucking great television. That's the type of Randy Orton I want to see on my television. I don't want to see Randy Orton pandering to the crowd, giving high fives. You know, I don't want to see people jumping for fucking RKOs. I want to see Randy Orton doing vile, vicious acts to WWE talent. That's what I want to see. My dad even texted me. He was watching SmackDown Live. He's like, Nakamura had that match lost. Jeff Hardy was going to be the new champion. Where did Randy Orton come from? Why did Randy Orton put his finger in Jeff Hardy's earlobe? I don't know, Dad, but all I know is that Randy Orton, as a heel, as a bad guy, is great television. So I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Nakamura as U.S. champion, Jeff Hardy, and then Randy Orton in a triple threat match? That's a, wor- that's a match worthy of SummerSlam, no question. It's going to be interesting, because Randy Orton was yelling, Do you want to know why? Do you want to know why? It's a good storyline, man. Everybody instantly, again, engaged and invested in Randy Orton for a simple heel turn. It's good television. Love it. NXT, man. NXT. Nothing happened on NXT this week outside of a number one contender triple threat match, which, again, NXT's women continue to dominate Raw and SmackDown women. No question. Shayna Baez was fantastic at what she does. She said very little on commentary, but keep it that way. Kyrie Sane and Shayna Baszler at TakeOver Brooklyn number four. That's the match to go with. I knew they were going with that. It's the match that makes the most sense. I'm all for it. I don't want to talk about what's happening next week because clearly it was all spoiled. WWE sent out the spoiler. We had every fucking analyst and journalist talk about it on Twitter. It's no fucking secret what happened during the next set of tapings. I'm not going to spoil anything here, and I don't want to talk about it. The most important thing to me going into next week's show, which probably is going to be one of the most talked about things in all of WWE all year, is Champa Gargano Black. How did we get to the outcome that was spoiled next week? That's all I care about. That's all I care about. I don't want to know who won. I don't give a fuck who won. I don't give a shit. All I want to sit down and enjoy is how we got there. It's fine. It's okay that I know what happened next week. It's fine. But the thing for me is how that match ended. And that's what I'm going to be paying close attention to. That's what I'm putting under the microscope. Because... Either way you look at it, all three of those guys are going to be involved in the main event for TakeOver Brooklyn. And if that's the case, uh, SummerSlam, you are fighting an uphill battle already. But NXT TakeOver Brooklyn is shaping up to be yet another fucking classic. Another classic. And it's getting very difficult for any show anywhere to compete with what NXT does with these TakeOver shows. NXT this week planted so many fucking seeds that you don't even need the spoilers to come up with a a reason for TakeOver Brooklyn. You you, kind of figured out what was going on on this week's NXT TV. Adam Cole versus Ricochet. Gonna be a great fucking match for the North American title. Kyrie Sane versus Shayna Baszler. Great match. Mae Young Classic Finals revisited. Both women have one win over each other. It's gonna be a great match. Both women have come a long way since the Mae Young Classic. Kyrie Sane has been in the WWE for a year now. Shayna Baszler is probably the best female 
in the WWE right now, especially based on where she was last year. Completely different wrestler now in 2018. It's the match that makes the most sense. Undisputed Era versus Mustache Mountain. They do a rematch. Everybody gets a rematch clause, right? WWE's got this shitty fucking thing of rematch clauses. Everybody's do a rematch. Mustache Mountain's probably going to invoke their rematch clause again. And then you got EC3 and Velveteen Dream, which has been teased, going back to the UK stuff at Royal Albert Hall. There's your takeover. You don't need spoilers. You don't need TV tapings that haven't happened yet, that haven't aired on the network yet. It was all in NXT TV this week. And it's been on TV so far. You need to be paying attention to know what's going on. So if I spoiled anything for anybody, don't come and blame me that I spoiled NXT TakeOver for you. Just watch the fucking show. Everything you need to know has already happened. Don't at me. Anyway, that was your WWE Week in Review. We got a lot to talk about today. I I already went over the top story, so... I got more to talk about, but that was the big story. So we got another big story also about Daniel Bryan's contract status. So we'll talk about that today as well. I got a pro wrestling crate unboxing. I got another special unboxing that I got sent to me by a fan of the show, and I'm blown away by what's in the box. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to do these unboxings. We're going to go over a bunch of other shit that's been going on this week for me. Very exciting stuff coming up. We're going to go over everything right here. This is episode 231, part number one of Off The Script. Let's hit the intro, and I'll see you guys in a little bit. Off this shitty fucking product by coming on here and speaking the fucking goddamn truth about this fucking filth. And I can book a better show taking a fucking dump after eating my fucking Chipotle. Terezo with extra cheese! I don't give a fuck what anybody has to say. Have I ever? Of course not. WWE is great, eh? Uh, fuck you, Japan, and, uh, Canada, oh, Canada! Ah, Tony! What is it, bitch? Can I suck your dick? <laughs> what is it, bitch? This is the number one fucking podcast right here on YouTube.com. This is off the script. Ken Broadway currently holds the Break the Glass Ceiling contract, which guarantees him a title shot in any singles title in House of Glory. Coincidentally, the man that he overcame to win that battle royal is sitting right across from me, you. Take me back to that moment where it was just the two of you left standing in that ring. What was going through your mind? And where were you at mentally to see Broadway celebrating with that contract? What has that done to you mentally as far as, as, far as moving on from that? And what did it mean to you professionally to defeat Ken at Temperature Rising? To see Ken win that. And he cheated in my, in my head. He cheated. He blindsided me. He headbutted me. He kicked me in my head. What is this? I thought we was being professional in the ring. Am I right? Aren't we supposed to be professionals? Every man for himself. True. But in that ring, at least I gave him the respect at that moment. Seeing Ken win that contract. I guess it bothered me a little bit. Because I'm up next. Ken had his time already. He's been there, he's done that, he messed up. I'm the reason why all this came into fruition. You know that, right? Do you know that? MBK, me holding cash flow on my back, not him. He sent me out to do a lot of things for him. So to see him win that contract and to see him be able to, 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 what, to fight for any belt? It bothers me a lot. He don't deserve none of that. He's worked just as hard as you? No, he hasn't. He definitely did it. You think so? You think so? You really think so, JD? Yes, I do. From where I'm sitting, every every event, he's just he's working just as hard as you are. Let's talk about from when I first came in. At chapter one with JT Dunn. Who helped him beat JT Dunn? Okay, who helped him beat Tony Nese? 
Okay. Uh, who else? Who else would be Leo Rush? So, are you insinuating that cash flow success is because of you? Yes. Definitely. Because without me, without Murder by Kicks, without that, Ken would have been irrelevant. I brought him new life. He was a scrub before I came. You seen who he was with? He was with Leroy and a female who's not even here and three other scrubs that's not even here no more. All they were doing was kissing his ass. When I first came in, I, I made him become a monster again. But when we was little kids, that's the Ken Broadway I wanted. And I made him into that. Man, how good was that fucking clip, dude? Oh my God. I watched that thing about a dozen times in the last 12 hours since I got the final version just sent to me by House of Glory, man. Unbelievable stuff. That was a sit-down I conducted on Wednesday for House of Glory. I went to the school and we started filming the debut episode of Cutting Corners with JD. I'm going to be interviewing a lot of House of Glory talent. I'm going to be sitting down with them and getting their name and their brand out there through my social media, through this podcast, and it's going to be great, man. I sat down with Matt Travis, who's one of the best up-and-coming talents at House of Glory. Guy trains his ass off, he works his ass off, and I sat down with him and I asked him about what's going on currently with him inside House of Glory, where his mindset is at. Sat down with him for 15 minutes, man, and it came out so fucking great, man. Jason is a mastermind who did so much work that you guys did not see, man. The setup for this thing was was ridiculous. The, 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 the hard work that he puts in to, to make me look good, to make Matt look good, it, it's stuff that you don't see. But when you guys see this final product and everything that's going to be with this show, you're going to be a fan of House of Glory. You're going to be a fan of me, and it's just going to be great, man. I'm going to put my entire 100% effort into this thing, and I can't wait for you guys to see the final product. That is just a clip, a teaser of Cutting Corners, the debut episode with Matt Travis. Hopefully, it will be released sometime this weekend, if not early next week. And then I think I'm going back on Wednesday, and we're going to be interviewing one of the female talents at House of Glory, the queen of House of Glory, Sonia Strong. So it's going to be great, man. I already got questions lined up for Sonia. It is going to be fucking awesome. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Thank you to Amazing Red, House of Glory, and Jason for all their hard work and believing in me and this project. Going to be great. High Intensity 7, man. We got Enzo. We got Sammy Callahan. We got Austin Aries. Low Key has already signed on to go one-on-one -on -one with Sammy Callahan. At high intensity seven. So you guys are going to be blown away by what we got coming up. The NYC arena, man. August 17th, HOGWrestling.net. If you guys still want tickets, they are still available. Whatever's left. It's going to be a damn near sellout, man. So that is the only wrestling event outside WWE that you need to care about. Summer Slam weekend. It is our WrestleMania. It is House of Glory's WrestleMania. So make sure you guys... Go get your tickets and make sure you guys keep an, an ear and an eye on Cutting Corners with JD. I've been going back and forth with Ticket True, man, uh, ever since we got back from Pittsburgh. He said the same thing to me. You know, my body is still in Pittsburgh, but, you know, my mind is, you know, all over the place with House of Glory and getting off the script ready and then all the coverage for WWE that happened this week. What a great time in Pittsburgh, man. Uh, if you guys seen the Shane Douglas interview, thank you for all the kind words, man. I, I had everybody from, from Ticket Drew to Solomons to reach out to me. That was my first real full-fledged interview for any podcast that I conducted on my own with a professional wrestler or an ex-professional wrestler, man. Shane Douglas was so nice. Uh, down to earth, he's a craft beer guy, which I didn't know, so that opened up the floodgates there, even before we hit record, we were talking about Brooklyn Brewery, but it, it was so great, man, and the, and the reaction and the reception to it was phenomenal, so I'm hoping that I can get somebody else, whomever that may be, in the future, but thank you guys so much for all the support on that podcast, it was so great to, to see and to read how you guys love that, and if you missed it, 
It is live on the channel right now, man. That was the official end to off the script last week, and that went up on Tuesday. So make sure you guys go and check that out, man. The franchise, Shane Douglas on Off the Script, live on Off the Script. We, we recorded it live from Terrace on, Fli on 5th, right across from the PPG Paints Arena, just hours before Extreme Rules, man. So if you guys want to go check that out, plus NXT, SmackDown, my Extreme Rules review, and Monday Night Raw, all those videos will be in the annotation that you see in the top right corner of your screen. Thank you guys for all the support this weekend. Uh, this week, rather, and we uh, we have more to come for sure, man. It's going to be a busy, busy, busy week coming up with House of Glory and then a busy month of August for literally everything, man. SummerSlam, House of Glory, getting ready for Chicago and all in. Going to be all over the place, so hopefully you guys are with me. It's going to be fun. Follow me on Twitter, man, at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. We are inching closer to 95,000 subscribers, man. Thank you guys so much, man. I, I feel, I feel 100,000 coming on, man. So hopefully before the end of the year, we will be there and we can officially say, you know what? We are 100K strong. I got my YouTube plaque and off the script is off and running past 100K, man. So thank you guys so much. Make sure you guys are subscribed down below. Let's get this out of the way, man. Barbershop window, you guys know the deal. Barbershopwindow.com. I'll be holding I'll be holding meet and greets SummerSlam weekend. So make sure you guys get your merchandise. I'll be in Chicago for all in during podcast row. I'll be there. So make sure you guys have your t-shirts ready. If you guys are gonna come out and meet me, I will be everywhere uh this coming August and into all in in Chicago, man. But I want to see you guys wearing some t-shirts. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Get your t-shirts today. 15 different designs. It's a great way to support the show. Harrys.com slash script. You guys want the best shave of your life? Harry's is going to fucking give it to you, man. And they are an official sponsor with Off The Script for the entirety of 2018. Razor blade, razor handle, a razor blade protective case, and that shave gel which feels fucking fantastic, man. This is going to be the one thing that you use over and over and over again and whatever you guys got in your medicine cabinet, in your bathrooms right now, whatever you guys are using for your shaving utensils, you're going to get rid of that and Harry's is going to be your number one go-to product for all your shaving needs, man. Harry's.com slash script and Audible. They've been a great friend of the podcast for over a year and a half now. They are an official sponsor of the show. AudibleTrial.com slash off the script. They have over 200,000 different audio books to choose from. Five of which are right there in that thumbnail, man. You could go get Jericho, Shawn Michaels, Justin Roberts, who will be it all in. JR, Jim Ross, AJ Lee, Daniel Bryan, Brett the Hitman, Hart, Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, Roddy Piper, Dusty Rhodes, Brock Lesnar. Plus other genres as well, man. That's audibletrial.com slash off the script. And if you guys have already signed up, tell a family member, tell a friend, tell a coworker, tell a classmate. You guys can spread the word of Audible. Give the gift of audibletrial.com slash off the script, man. Thank you guys so much for all your support. I want to open this up, man. This was sent to me by Brian and... He is a listener of the show, and he's been a listener of the show for many years. He was one of my, uh, he's actually a very early supporter. He's, a, he's definitely a VIP member of Team JD. I mentioned how I went to Hot Topic, and I mentioned how I got there maybe 15 minutes too late before they sold the early editions of the Hot Topic exclusive of the new Funkos, the new Funko Pop for New Japan Pro Wrestling, the Young Bucks. And he immediately hit me up on Twitter via a DM. And he's like, dude, I got you. I got you. They got a whole bunch of them I'm at my Hot Topic. I'll mail you. He had my, my, my mailing address because he had mailed me something previously in the past. And he sends me a UPS tracking number. And within a day or two, it was here. And I want to give a shout out to Brian Argo, 
who sent me this beautiful bubble wrapped mint condition. We got it wrapped here. It was on my doorstep today. If I could get this bubble wrap off, I appreciate the care. Dude, look at this. Got the Young Bucks Hot Topic exclusive Funko Pop, man. Oh, they look fucking fantastic, dude. I love that. I love that. I wanted the Hot Topic exclusive because it's got the the uh, the different outfits. I already pre-ordered Kenny Omega, Cody, and the Young Bucks from Pro Wrestling Tees with the special t-shirt that they have paired along with the package. It was like $60 for all four. Uh, but this I wanted, and there you go, man. That is great. Absolutely love it. That's the back. Young Bucks, Bullet Club, Funko Pop, the only non-WWE professional wrestling Funko Pop that is available, man. That is fucking awesome. So thank you to Brian, man. I, I literally have the best fans in the entire world. What we got here, man, my favorite unboxing... All month is Pro Wrestling Crate. This is Pro Wrestling T's version of their monthly subscription. And we are a huge fan of Pro Wrestling T's here. They are an official sponsor of the show. Barbershop Window is affiliated with Pro Wrestling T's. So I have my online store set up through them. And there's no better quality of product in the independent wrestling scene right now than Pro Wrestling Crate, man. Unbelievable stuff, great quality, and I love Pro Wrestling Crate. If you guys love what you see here, ProWrestlingCrate.com, and then you're going to choose your subscription, and then when you get to checkout, you're going to type in the code off the script, and you're going to get 20% off your first subscription, man. You cannot, you cannot touch that deal. So if you guys like anything that you see here, go to ProWrestlingCrate.com and follow them on Twitter, PWCrate. On Twitter. Let's see what we got in here, man. See what we got. We got Heels Part 2. That is the cheat sheet right there. I'm not going to be looking at the back. Next month's crate. They already give you a glimpse into next month. Big in Japan. Ooh. Hopefully we get some Kenny Omega merchandise in that, man. I can use a new Kenny Omega t-shirt. Wow. Okay. We got, uh, what do we got here? I thought there was three t-shirts, but there's only two. I love this. I absolutely love it, man. Look at that. Starting off hot. The villain. Marty Skrull. Man, that's a fucking sick looking t-shirt right there. Holy shit. I'll be wearing that tomorrow. I'll be wearing that tomorrow, man. That's fucking great. Love that. What do we got here? Purple doesn't look good on me. But I'll wear this one around the house, man. Fear the madness. Macho madness right there, man. And a nice looking purple. Macho man Randy Savage. There you go, bro. That is fucking beautiful, man. So far, so good with Pro Wrestling Crate. Like I said, the best wrestling, the wrestling subscription you could possibly subscribe each and every month, man. Oh my god, look at this. They gave this guy his own fucking baseball card. I hope to see him at House of Glory, high intensity seven, man. Sammy Zane, oh, uh, Sammy Callahan. I'm sorry, bro. Sorry. Look at this. They gave him his own fucking baseball card. 5'9, 210 pounds from Ohio. The all seeing eye as his finishing move. And then we got, uh,. Quick hits. In January of 2018, Sammy, the Dayton slugger, Callahan, infamously teed off on the face of Eddie Edwards with his trademark black baseball bat. To the shock of the wrestling world, Callahan embraced the violent act in media across the world, cementing him as one of the top heels in the business today. There you go. Sammy Callahan, motherfucker. Beat the shit out of me at House of Glory. We'll see what happens, man. Look at this. Look at this, man. This is fucking nice. I love these things, man. These micro brawlers. Tetsuya Naito. Look at that. That's nice, man. That's a fucking nice little uh, figure of him there. He'll stay right here next to Cody and Jericho on my desk. There you go. What do we got? What else we got here, man? 
Um, we got a pin. We got a collector pin. Oh, goes with my t-shirt. Piper's Pit pin. Look at that. There you go. Exclusive only to Pro Wrestling Crate. Ooh. These usually come in handy, man. I love this stuff. We got a pocket knife. The last real man's pocket knife. Silas Young of Ring of Honor. Look at that, man. Uh, maybe I'll take this to House of Glory. If uh, if Sammy Callahan wants to bring his baseball bat, I'll just fucking pull out my uh, Silas Young if I can get this fucking thing open. And probably He, he would have probably bashed me in the fucking head with his baseball bat. There you go. Let's fucking give him a couple of jabs, you know? It's pretty cool. Behind Closed Doors with Jake the Snake Roberts. High Spots Wrestling Network presents Behind Closed Doors with Jake the Snake Roberts. Man, look at that. DVD that I probably will never watch because who the fuck watches DVDs anymore? And we got one more. It's usually the picture, the autograph. Who do we got? Who do we got? Who do we got? That's upside down. Man, this guy's all over the... Is this, is this, is this like an omen? Is this going to be an omen for what's to come for me at House of Glory? Are you fucking kidding me? Are you kidding me here? I gotta have this fucking bum? Yeah, he signed it. He also signed his boot to my fucking face about a month ago. Oh my God. Are you fucking kidding me, pro wrestling great? Jesus Christ. Unbelievable, man. What is it, the Sammy Callahan box? Come on, bruh. Anyway. It's a pretty decent crate. ProWrestlingCrate.com. If you guys want a coupon code, it's off the script. At checkout, 20% off. Love it. It was great outside the Sammy Callahan bullshit. But you guys see how much quality goes into one crate, man. Two t-shirts. You got a DVD. You got an autograph. The t-shirts alone go for $15, $20. So you're getting your money's worth anyway. And it's a pro wrestling tee. The quality is unbelievable. ProWrestlingCrate.com and coupon code off the script. Thank you guys so very much. And Brian, again, thank you for the Funko Pop, bro. You are a beast, and I love you, bro. Thank you for the support. Moving on here, man. Let's get on with the news this week for Friday. Off the script. Told you guys that I had a story on Daniel Bryan. Now, I was at, uh, I was going to say SummerSlam. I'll be at SummerSlam. But I was at Extreme Rules with Brian Goolish. I was there with Justin Labar. And I was there with Drew Badala, Take a Drew. Drew taps me on the shoulder. He's like, did you hear about Daniel Bryan? I'm like, yeah. Uh, he tweeted something out. And then the Wrestle Votes, who, you know, to me, is a very credible source. I don't know who the fuck it is. But he seems to be talking a lot of logic. And a lot of the things that he talks about are happening. So, who, who, whomever that individual is, you know, it, it's a pretty reliable source. More re reliable than probably who you go to to get your news. But Drew tapped me on the shoulder. Did you hear about Daniel Bryan? I did. And I had Sean Ross Sapp say something on my Twitter wall about it. And a bunch of other people reported Daniel Bryan was signed, or he had signed an extension with the WWE. Then you had some people detract it. It's not true. Meltzer came out and said that it's not confirmed yet, kind of throwing a damper on everybody's parade. But we don't really know. We don't really know. And this story was taken this week, following Extreme Rules. There is a major creative decision in Daniel Bryan's WWE contract status. Now, Daniel Bryan's WWE future has been up in the air for the majority of this year. He was brought back to WWE television, and WWE has been scrambling, sitting down with Bryan to get this guy signed so they don't have to worry about him going elsewhere. Before that happened, the feeling was that another promotion would let Daniel Bryan wrestle again. Now, what that means is that he made his in-ring return back in March. The feeling was that if Daniel Bryan was not let back into the WWE in a wrestling capacity, he would go wrestle for New Japan, Ring of Honor, 
And clearly WWE was against this idea. Not because of Daniel Bryan's health, not because of their medical team looking out for him, but Bryan had it ingrained in his mind. If you're not going to let me wrestle, I know I have had every doctor that I've been to clear me, except you guys. I am going to wrestle somewhere else. Thankfully, Vince McMahon and WWE's medical staff agreed to clear Daniel Bryan months ago, and right now, From what we've seen, it looks to be the right decision. Now, as WWE finally granted Brian his return, many fans have been hoping that this decision means he will stay with the company. Now, you look at what happened with Daniel Bryan in the landscape of things, and for someone who is as genuine as Bryan, why would he walk away from the WWE after all that they have done for him to give him this platform to come back? You know, he met his wife through WWE. He's built a great life for himself through WWE. Why would you walk away from that? Now that it cleared you and you got your life back and things are going well, why would you not sign with the WWE again? It's something that really doesn't fit Daniel Bryan's character. Now, they granted his return and everybody wants him to stay with the company, clearly. WWE cannot afford to have Daniel Bryan, you know, go. Especially now. WWE, I don't give a shit what Meltzer says. I'm going to say this right now instead of waiting until I read this report. I don't give a fuck what Meltzer says. Daniel Bryan is not going anywhere else. With this new Japan MSG G1 Supercard announced. That announcement alone has granted Daniel Bryan a raise. No question. No question. The fact that All In is happening on the day that Daniel Bryan is a free agent, that granted him a raise. WWE is not going to let Daniel Bryan walk into another promotion that is going to be virtually competing against a WWE product in April. They're not. They are not going to give... Those guys, New Japan, Ring of Honor, they're not going to give those guys the fuel to gain more momentum. Daniel Bryan literally had to do nothing to get a raise. The raise was given to him by another rival promotion. So Daniel Bryan obviously wants what he wants, and if WWE is smart, they grant this guy whatever he wants within the boundaries of whatever WWE tends to do with these contract negotiations. Daniel Bryan wants to work with a certain someone, or if he wants some creative control, give him the right to work with who he wants. He's got a great enough mind for the business that can only make your product better. That's all I have to say there. <laughs> Everything else is null and void in this, in this report. Daniel Bryan's staying with the WWE. Whether Meltzer says so or not, he's virtually back with the company. He's not going anywhere. His current contract ends on September 1st in less than two months. As yet, nothing has been officially announced, been officially announced by either Brian or WWE. So it's not yet clear whether he will decide to stay or go. As well as potentially breaking the hearts of many fans. He'll break my heart if he leaves. Because I would love to see him once again at the top of SmackDown Live as the WWE Champion. This will seriously impact two of WWE's biggest pay-per-views if he does not re-sign. Now, we all were watching SmackDown Live on Tuesday, and the seeds were planted for Daniel Bryan versus The Miz. On this week's episode of SmackDown Live, we seem to get the first seeds planted for a massive feud between Daniel Bryan and The Miz. Those two have pretty much been at each other's throats for two years now. Since Talking Smack in 2016, two days after SummerSlam, where The Miz cut that unbelievable worked shoot promo. Even while Daniel Bryan was sidelined with an injury and acting as SmackDown Live's general manager at the time, the pair were at each other's throats, doing everything but wrestling in a wrestling ring. And once Brian was rumored for a return, the fans started to speculate that this feud would eventually happen and needed a conclusion. 
Now with this situation up in the air with Daniel Bryan's contract, WWE has apparently given Bryan two choices. According to the No Holds Barred podcast, take this with a grain of salt. I don't know how credible these guys are. If Daniel Bryan signs a new deal with the company, they will push his match back to WrestleMania 35. But if he doesn't, they will have to pull the trigger and have the pair feud before he leaves at SummerSlam next month. And I quote, this was said on the podcast, if you're ever going to play the three, four-year waiting game between Miz and Daniel Bryan, you better pull the trigger right now because you may not have it, says the podcast. That's why they are going with the match at SummerSlam. I've been told that if he does sign, the match is going to be held off till WrestleMania, end quote. So it looks like one of the most anticipated feuds in recent years will all come down to what Brian decides to do. I don't know where they got their information from. And I am okay. I'm not completely on board because I want more of a reason for them to fight. For everybody stating that, well, talking smack and whatever they've been built up or whatever they had been building up for the last two years is more more than enough of a reason to have these guys wrestle at SummerSlam. Really? Is WWE going to play all that stuff and refresh our minds? This is two years. Are, 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 Are WWE going to go back to every instance in which The Miz and Daniel Bryan got at each other, crossed each other's paths before Daniel Bryan came back? Now, I'm okay with them fighting at SummerSlam. And we may be headed towards that because, again, just like Reigns and Lashley that I talked about in the beginning of this show, Daniel Bryan and The Miz have nothing to do at SummerSlam. Nothing. WWE could pair them in a tag team. WWE could have The Miz and Daniel Bryan go after the Bludgeon Brothers and win the tag team championships and we can have this tired yet very typical disgruntled tag team in which you have a heel and a baby face hold the tag team championships forced to work together and then they eventually break down you know Miz goes on to win the WWE championship leaves the tag team championship with Daniel Bryan behind he moves on you know didn't give a shit about the team Bryan knew that the Miz was all about himself and he was proved right Miz goes on to beat AJ Styles for the WWE title, leaves Daniel Bryan high and dry as tag team champion, and then Daniel Bryan goes on to win the Royal Rumble and challenges the Miz at WrestleMania for the WWE Championship. That's one way you could do it, but you got to get from point A to point B. How are you going to get Daniel Bryan and the Miz to, to, to be a pairing, a team, to go against the Bludgeon Brothers? This is why WWE, I feel like they, they, they have not put anything into motion. This is where long-term booking, you know, is going to reap the benefits. We're, we are three and a half weeks away from SummerSlam, and I, I'm talking about Daniel Bryan and The Miz, your tag team champions. They don't have anything going on at SummerSlam. It's, it's not right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I mean... You should have a a plan in place for your tag team championships. How do you get them there? What are they fighting for? If you put The Miz and Daniel Bryan in a match at SummerSlam, what are they fighting over? I don't like you. You don't like me. That's not enough of a reason to fight. This is why The Miz having money in the bank was the best outcome in June. And they gave it to Braun Strowman, who did not need it. His character fits nothing into the money in the bank mold. I don't know what's going on here, but just like I mentioned with Lashley and Reigns, if you don't pair them at SummerSlam, who the fuck do you pair them against? Who do you put the Miz against? Who do you put the Miz against? Who do you put Daniel Bryan against? Nakamura is going to be busy with Randy Orton and Jeff Hardy. You can put Daniel Bryan against Almas. I would love to see that match. That's a summer. That's a fucking WrestleMania match. I'd like to see that. You know, almost couldn't get the job done with AJ Styles, but he gets the job done against Daniel Bryan. Daniel Bryan can afford a loss. He doesn't lose any momentum. You know what that would do for almost if he if he beats Daniel Bryan? Joe is probably going to be paired with Styles. Who do you put 
with Daniel Bryan if he doesn't wrestle The Miz? Who do you put The Miz against if he doesn't wrestle Daniel Bryan? Nobody. There is no one on the roster right now that you could pair with The Miz. There isn't another babyface outside of Daniel Bryan. Everyone else is going to be busy. Now, if WWE was smart, they could have easily played off a Ty Dillinger and The Miz. They have some history. If Ty Dillinger was in a better position on SmackDown Live, you could have put Ty Dillinger versus The Miz in a nice mid-card match at SummerSlam. That would be something I would be very interested in seeing. Then you could put Daniel Bryan versus Andrade Almas. What do you do with Almas at SummerSlam? Who do you put him against? You're going to leave one of your best wrestlers on the roster off of SummerSlam? This is why I'd much rather not have Daniel Bryan and The Miz at SummerSlam. Because they need more of a reason to fight. And I think you could fill the card a lot better if they are in separate matches. The WWE Championship is going to be the real reason why these guys are feuding. A few words back and forth. Oh, you know, you should have stayed retired. You're a glory hog. You love to steal the spotlight. You're a failure. Blah, blah, blah. Words, words, words. It's like shit that you say back and forth to somebody you hate on social media. It's only words. That's not enough of a reason to have these guys feud. You know? That's just the way I see it. I feel like it's too early for Daniel Bryan and The Miz to go one-on-one at SummerSlam. Now, if it does happen, I worry about other aspects of SummerSlam. I really do. I'm not going to be against it if it does get announced, but... I feel like if we wait, it would be that much more special. But I'm hoping WWE, if they do give it to us at SummerSlam, it's just simply another layer on top of this big cake that they're building, and we still eventually get them to continue feuding in an even more important situation. That's just the way I see it. But if WWE was smart, you know, they would fill out the SummerSlam card the best that they can, Ty Dillinger hasn't been built up at all since being moved up from NXT. They had a back and forth with Ty Dillinger and The Miz happen on social media that was never brought to TV. I would have loved that. When The Miz was IC champion, that would have been perfect. That would have been perfect. A win over The Miz for Ty Dillinger would have been fantastic for him. And then you could have put Brian against Almas. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I raise a lot of great points here. You know? Let me know what you guys think about that down below. I don't know what I don't know what to tell you. I don't want to see it happen, but I'm not going to complain if I see it happen. But I don't think putting them in the match at SummerSlam is going to fill out SummerSlam's card uh, as great as it could be. Brian versus Almas, and then Miz versus somebody else. I, at that point, I don't know who. You know, it, it, it would probably be better off for the feud in the long run. That's just me. Let me know what you guys think about that down below. I don't want. Uh, I don't want to really talk about this, but I feel like I have to because it was in the news. You know, this is a very sensitive topic to a lot of people, and I don't want to say the wrong thing, so I'm just going to keep it very simple. I'm going to go over the news of Hulk Hogan and Titus O'Neil walking out of Extreme Rules because Hulk Hogan was there addressing the entire locker room and being reinstated into the WWE Hall of Fame. But I don't want to ruffle any feathers in a negative way. But I want to bring at least some common sense to the discussion, okay? Hulk Hogan's inevitable return was always going to cause a big stir in the WWE, both backstage and with the viewing audience. Fans won't need reminding about what happened back in 2015. Now, whatever happened back in 2015 with Hulk Hogan and the derogatory words and slurs that he used was enough for WWE to release him from his contract cutting all ties with him, all references, excommunicating him, even removing him from the Hall of Fame. Now, rumors once again emerged over the weekend of Extreme Rules that Hulk Hogan was on his way back to the WWE. I was at Terrace on 5th, and I was hearing from fans that they seen Hogan in Pittsburgh along with Jimmy Hart. So then it was revealed that Hogan was definitely backstage at Extreme Rules before the event addressing the WWE locker room. Although... This is all speculation with Hogan. 
You know, talks obviously ramped up on Saturday after it was revealed that he was spotted flying into Cleveland, which is just hours away from Pittsburgh, which was the site of Extreme Rules. Speculation then turned into confirmation as WWE actually revealed on their social media that Hogan was reinstated into the Hall of Fame after a three-year suspension and also met stars backstage. Now, more details have emerged about what happened backstage with sources claiming that it was all relatively emotional while fellow Hall of Famer Mark Henry has revealed that the locker room is currently split on his return. Now, No Holds Barred podcast, again, the same people that cited the Daniel Bryan story, have revealed that Titus O'Neil flipped out and stormed out of the arena after seeing Hogan backstage at Extreme Rules. I quote, Titus O'Neil is a very big spokesman for everything there is WWE, and he basically had a fit at the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. He was taken away from what I heard. This is according to No Holds Bar podcast. He was at the arena, and he saw Hogan and said, what is he doing here? And they explained that he was reinstated to Titus O'Neil. Hogan, to his credit, came and tried to shake his hand and talk to him, but Titus packed his bags and left. Titus hasn't hidden the fact that he's against a Hulk Hogan return to the WWE. More sources, sources, sauces, sauce. That's where my mind is. I'm fucking fried. Ringside News brought more sources uh, to this with two comments which Titus liked. So they reported on their website that Titus liked two comments on Instagram both of which were seemingly against Hogan returning to the WWE and being reinstated into the Hall of Fame. It wouldn't be a big surprise if this happened, as Henry himself said that the WWE locker room is currently split on his return. Whether or not Titus's feelings remain this way is to be determined. But a reaction like that should have been anticipated by WWE at some point. I've mentioned this time and time again. I am not for anything that Hulk Hogan said in 2015. It was disgusting. It shouldn't have been said. And he was completely in the wrong. Now, on the other hand, he was illegally videotaped. His privacy was invaded. And that in itself is wrong. But he said what he said, it leaked to the public, and it put him in a negative light, and I don't give a shit who you are. I don't give a shit who you are. You shouldn't be talking like that to anybody. Family, friends, nobody. It's disgusting. I don't talk that way, and nobody should be talking that way. In public or behind closed doors. It's fucking disgusting. Okay? WWE is a business, and WWE, after three years, has decided that enough time has passed, and enough punishment has been brought to Hulk Hogan, that they decided to bring him back. It is a business. WWE would not be bringing Hulk Hogan back if, A, he didn't deserve to be back, B, they didn't think they could make money off of him. Clearly, Hulk Hogan is still a viable option for WWE to make money. This is a business. Wherever they find where they could make money, they are going to do it. Do I agree with Titus being upset? Of course. I see his side. I see everybody's side who don't want him back in the WWE, but on the other side, you got to realize that this is a business. Hulk Hogan is going to be a reason for WWE to make money. Whether it's merchandise, bringing him back on TV, whatever. Whatever. This is a business and they're bringing him back because they see him still as a viable option to make money. Hulk Hogan, you know, I, I, I don't understand WWE, well, I, I understand WWE's stance on this, but I don't understand the the backlash to Hogan being brought back. Did people really expect him to be, like, exonerated forever? I, I, I mean, honestly, 
to me, everybody makes mistakes. And I think three years is enough time for someone to sit with their own thoughts and, and, and realize that he fucked up. It's not as if Hulk Hogan hasn't been doing and working to get back into the good graces of, of people and the general public. He's been working his ass off to try and re, I guess, rebrand himself and fix his image. Now, if he wasn't doing anything and he made the comments and didn't do anything at all, then I understand uh, uh, you know, everybody being upset. But the reason why we are all sitting here, the reason why you're a fan, the reason why you watched WWE when you grew up, and this fucking Italian, the Italian in me with my fucking hand motions, the reason why you grew up watching WWE was probably because of Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan is one of the biggest names that this industry has ever seen. The fact that you expected the reason pro wrestling here in the United States is as big as it is today, the reason you watched the company to begin with, the reason you fell in love with WWE to begin with, you expected Hulk Hogan to sit out the remainder of his career being exonerated from the WWE Hall of Fame, Without Hulk Hogan, where would the WWE be? Three years is enough for this guy to be punished. I understand Titus's stance. You know, I don't know whoever else is upset. Mark Henry did say that the company, you know, was split down the middle of, of him being back. But give this guy an opportunity to fucking fix himself. You know? It's as if these people are looking at Hogan and looking at him for doing something wrong, but on the other side, it's as if these people have never done anything wrong in their life to begin with either. You know? Everybody's done wrong. Everybody's said wrong or, or said something negative to a point where it's going to be backlashed against. Let this guy have the opportunity to fucking fix himself. You think Hogan wants to be exonerated from the fucking company he helped build? His life is professional wrestling. You know, whether you believe Hogan or not, whether you, you, you find him to be full of shit when he talks, whether, whatever your perception is of Hulk Hogan, you know, when he talks about the business, he was all about himself, he's fucking selfish, he's this and that, whether you like him or not, who cares? He's a human being. The one thing that we do know is that he loves this business. This business is his life. This is the reason why he was put on earth. This business, the WWE. If you don't think that Hogan is genuine in everything that he's done to fix himself here, to get back into the good graces with WWE and the good graces of professional wrestling, that's being completely unfair. Give this guy an opportunity to fix himself. Do I agree with Titus walking out? Yeah, I can't sit here and blame Titus for walking out. If you feel that strongly about something, that's Titus just acting out of how he feels. There's nothing wrong with that. You got to respect the fucking guy to walk out of a, of a major pay-per-view because of what the WWE did as far as a business decision. You know, Titus did something that I'm sure a lot of people in that company wanted to do, but didn't have the balls to do. That's commendable. You know, you can't blame everybody for feeling the way that they do. But there's a reason why this decision was made. You got to give him a chance to fix himself. Three years is a, a, a long, you think Hogan was fucking everything he worked so hard for. You think Hogan sat at home, you know, you know, not upset or crying about the fact that he was exiled from the WW Hall of Fame? erased from memory? If you don't think he's genuine about getting his, his way back into the business and, and, and rebuilding his brand and his name, you're a fool. You're a fool. You're foolish. Well, let's give this guy a chance. So there's two sides to the story. There's two ways to look at it. You can't blame Titus and you can't blame WWE for bringing him back. 
Am I happy to see Hogan back? I honestly don't give I don't don't give a shit. I don't care. I just want everybody to be happy. I really do. But it's a it's a big enough story to talk about. And it's a controversial topic that, you know, everybody seems to be up in arms about. So I wanted to mention it here. I didn't mention it because I was in and around Extreme Rules the entire weekend. I didn't get a chance to do an extra on it or talk about it. This is business, people. WWE's in the in, in, in the business to make money. And if Hogan is being brought back, then WWE still sees a, a way to make money off of him. And you got to take this into consideration too. We, I, I've stated it several times here. This is a business. With WWE going to Fox 5, Fox Sports, you don't think Fox is going to want the biggest names possible? This is a syndicated fucking network. Fox. If Hogan has as big of a name in wrestling as he does, Fox is going to look at that and be like, we want Hogan on TV when Fox gets SmackDown Live. Business. Business. If guys like A-Rod, if guys like, I don't know, Tiger Woods or whomever else have done wrong can get back into the good graces of the public eye, why can't Hulk Hogan? You know? Why can't Hulk Hogan? I don't know, man. The world is a fucked up place. Let's just see how it plays out. But, again, this is a business move. Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to accept the fact that WWE is in this to make money. Hogan still is a way for WWE to make money. WWE, speaking of Extreme Rules, made last-minute changes to Extreme Rules. The Extreme Rules pay-per-view is now in the books, and it's safe to say that the majority of the WWE fans including me, and I was there, were underwhelmed. It never really promised to deliver a memorable night, primarily since it was a D-level pay-per-view heading into SummerSlam. But still, there were some matches that did offer enough interest to make the event at least worth tuning into. Kevin Owens proved how much of a lunatic that he is with a ridiculous steel cage spot with Braun Strowman. The B team left the show as new Raw Tag Team Champions, which was pathetic, by the way, by defeating Bray Wyatt and Matt Hardy. There was the Iron Man match that was pretty much hijacked by the wrestling fans in Pittsburgh. They were more over for the clock, showing how much time was left in the match than Rollins and Ziggler. PW Insider, though, has revealed that WWE ended up making several significant late changes to the show, which shaped the entire pay-per-view. Now, according to sources, the first revealed that Hulk Hogan didn't meet with Vince McMahon as Vince McMahon wasn't even at the show. He was not in Pittsburgh for Extreme Rules. Instead, Vince remained in constant communications with officials, but it was Triple H and Billy Kidman who were working guerrilla position, but Vince still made some big changes to the event wherever that old man was. Initially, Bobby Lashley versus Roman Reigns was scheduled to be the main event. However, WWE decided against that based on fear of how the fans would react. And it actually worked out pretty decently for them. Now, if that match went on last, that would have been hijacked. No question. No question. WWE saved Reigns and Lashley. Uh, I didn't watch it back on the network, so I don't know how it came off on TV. But in the arena, they were pretty loud. And it didn't seem like it was too bad of a situation for Reigns and Lashley. They actually saved both of those guys by putting them on in the middle of the show, which should have been a priority anyway. That match should have never been talked about for a main event spot. There was nothing on the line. You would be devaluing the WWE Championship and the Intercontinental Championship and pretty much spitting in the face of everybody thinking that was a main event level match. No, it was not. You put it on in the right spot, and you saved yourself, and you saved those both. You saved both of those guys. Period. Lashley and Reigns. Ziggler and Rollins ended up going on last. However, the original plan for their Intercontinental Championship match was that they were going to open the show and set the tone for the pay per view, rather than go on last. It's being reported that the final hour of Extreme Rules was originally scheduled to feature the WWE Championship match with AJ Styles and Rusev. 
And then the Raw Women's Championship match between Alexa Bliss and Nia Jax before Lashley and Reigns would end the show. The call was made relatively late to switch the order around and give the Iron Man match the main event spot, something WWE officials wanted originally heading into Extreme Rules. In the end, it was a smart move on WWE's part, even if the Pittsburgh crowd wasn't receptive towards what uh, towards Ziggler and Rollins and what they offered in that match. Ziggler and Rollins at Extreme Rules did not deliver. I even put that in the title of my Extreme Rules pay-per-view review. They failed to deliver. The match was not what I expected. The match was booked poorly. It was produced miserably. And WWE, where we've seen these two guys on Monday Night Raw go 30 minutes and one fall, we got seven falls in about 20 minutes. Not really what I expect out of a match between Rollins and Ziggler. That match should have went zero falls up until the 30 minutes was up, and then we could have got a overtime ending. That would have kept everybody more intrigued in the match if you guys actually sat down and came up with Some brilliant near-fall spots, building intrigue from the fans. The fans looked at it. When when, when you showcase to the fans that you did 3-0 Rollins immediately, that's not going to keep people's interest. Whoever produced that match should be exiled from producing matches, period. I would not be surprised if it was Michael P.S. Hayes. Because he's an idiot like that. Whatever happened there... They fucked that match up almost immediately by having Rollins go up 3-0. And then Ziggler got his wins back. He got his falls back all because of Drew McIntyre. Whoever produced that match did not have Dolph Ziggler in mind. Dolph Ziggler may have retained the title, but they clearly didn't have Dolph Ziggler in mind with that match. All of Ziggler's falls came because of Drew McIntyre and him beating the shit out of Rollins. WWE... With their Iron Man match, 30 minutes, the clock, the scoreboard on the Titan Tron. At one point, it was up during the beginning of the match. And then WWE took it away because the fans, after one or two minutes after the match started, started to hijack the match. They, they started to count down as if it was a Royal Rumble match. Every 10, sec- every 10 seconds before the next minute began, they started counting down from 10 as if it was the Royal Rumble. Now... Some people take that as the fans having fun. Some people loved it. Many people hated it. Ziggler and Rollins were even caught speaking about it. You know, it it was actually better with the clock up. The WWE took the clock away and it made things worse. The fans literally hijacked the show at that point. And these are the same fans that go and hijack a Roman Reigns and Bobby Lashley match. Or a Roman Reigns match in general. You know, Pittsburgh may have been fun. The crowd may have been fun if you, were, if you were sitting there. I didn't find it to be fun. I actually found it to be pathetic. And the reason why I found it to be pathetic is because when you got a guy like Rollins and a guy like Ziggler in the main event and you're doing that to them, how does that make you fans look when you want to do the same thing to Roman? You're going to give WWE all the reason in the world to put Roman in the main event. Look, Rollins and Ziggler are getting the same treatment as Roman. It makes no fucking difference. The fans in Pittsburgh literally fucked up. Hypocrites. You're going to do that when Roman's in the main event and then the fans who are claiming that Rollins and Ziggler were disrespected you're made to look hypocritical. What do you think those same fans are going to say when Roman's in the main event and they do that to him? The fans are, uh, are being disrespectful. If you're going to be disrespectful to, Reigns and Roll- uh, to Rollins and Ziggler, rather, you know, it just makes everybody look bad. It makes every crowd look bad. It, it, it was literally disgusting to see that. And I sat there, second row, and I hated it. After the fact that I'm thinking about it, I hated it. Now, the match wasn't good, and they probably could have saved themselves from that happening if they put on a decent match. I 
guarantee you, I would make a prediction that if WWE booked that match the way it should have been, that would have never happened. That would have never happened. After three or four minutes, Rollins was up 3 nothing. If these guys went 30 minutes just two weeks ago. They fucked up. WWE is to, is to blame for that. WWE is clearly to blame for that, but you can't you can't put Reigns in the main event and, and, and then look at Rollins and Ziggler and, and say it's okay for one and not okay for the other. Everybody looks like a fucking idiot. I don't know, man. The, the, this is why, I, you know, I'm going to say it again and I'm going to continue saying it where it needs to be said. Professional wrestling fans are the dumbest fucks on the planet. We don't know what we want. I'm not saying I'm a perfect fan. I'm a logical fan. I know when to respect someone, and I know when to shit on someone. Rollins and Ziggler was booked terribly. Everybody is to blame. The fans are to blame. WWE's to blame. Whoever produced the W the, that that WWIC title match is to blame. Rollins and Ziggler are to blame. They didn't bring their A game. They didn't bring their A game at all. But after waiting for four hours, can you fucking blame them for not bringing their A game? These shows are too long. It's another story for a different day, but, you know, you're going to put Rollins and Ziggler on the main event? Don't, don't do that when guys like Rollins and Ziggler are in the main event. It's disgusting. Moving on here, man. A couple more stories and we're going to get the hell out of here. Um, May Young Classic. Can't wait to see it happen. More names have been announced for the May Young Classic. The brackets keep filling up. Earlier this summer, the WWE announced the second annual May Young Classic tournament, which will be taking place next month. The announcement immediately brought up the discussion of who would be participating in this year's tournament. Several names have already been announced, but with 32 names in total, the tournament has several spots left. As of this weekend, four more names were announced. In a new article by WWE.com, four names have been confirmed for the tournament. Added to the field are Tegan Knox, Deanna Perrazzo, who's big enough in the indie scene that it's going to cause some excitement. Jessica Alaban, or Alaban, and Reina Gonzalez. Now, Knox signed with WWE last year after wrestling in Europe under the name of Nixon Newell. Perrazzo has wrestled around the world. She was a stud on the indie scene including Impact Wrestling, Ring of Honor. She was also on NXT for a cup of tea. Elaban has been in NXT since last October, but hasn't appeared on television. Gonzalez participated in the tournament last year, losing to Nicole Savoy in the first round. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I did not really care for Reina Gonzalez, so, I mean, that really is nobody I'm going to really pay attention to. I, I didn't find her to be interesting at all last year, but Deanna Perrazzo... In this tournament, that's exciting. Uh, we got Shirai already announced. We got, I believe, Tony Storm's going to be in it. I don't see why Tony Storm would not be in it. Caitlyn's back. She's in the tournament. I'm, I'm hearing rumors of Maria Kanellis could be making a comeback in the tournament. Should be fun, man. Uh, I'm expecting a much better May Young Classic this year, and I'm definitely excited to see how they go about it in August. Finally, guys. NXT is bringing back War Games for Survivor Series weekend. That's all I need to say, man. What do you want me to say about it? War Games last year was fucking phenomenal. It was a great match. One of the best matches all year for WWE. And it's coming back. The NWA introduced a concept called War Games in July of 1988. The match became the company's signature match and the ultimate in team combat. However, after 1998, the match went into storage for 19 years, and it hasn't been seen again until last year when NXT resurrected the concept for one of its most anticipated matches in WWE history. This time, though, the wait may not be as long. Announced on WWE.com, NXT will be bringing back War Games this year on November 17th in Los Angeles for the takeover before... Survivor Series. This will be the second year the match has taken place in a row after last year's three-way version between the Undisputed Era, the Authors of Pain, Roderick Strong, and Sanity. There is currently no word on who will be in the match or how large the teams will be. I can imagine 
It would be Undisputed Era. I can imagine Mustache Mountain or British Strong Style with Pete Dunne, Trent Seven, and Tyler Bate. Who that third team is, I don't know. I don't know. We have to wait and see, but bringing back War Games for Survivor Series weekend, you know Triple H is always looking to outdo himself with these takeovers. There you go. Bringing back War Games, he's a step ahead of the curve for Survivor Series weekend. If SummerSlam wasn't uh, already looking at a second place finish in August, Survivor Series is already behind the eight ball for November. So take over, man. They're doing their thing. Every takeover event seems to be better and better each and every time out. I expect nothing less from Triple H when it comes to these takeover shows. The War Games should not disappoint whatsoever, man. I'm getting out of here. Thank you guys so very much. That is part one for episode 231 on this Friday. Thank you guys so very much for everything. If you guys enjoyed the video, please hit that thumbs up. Follow me on Twitter at JD from NY206. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. Barbershopwindow.com slash off the script. Harry's.com slash script for your free trial shave set. And audibletrial.com slash off the script. Remember, prowrestlingcrate.com. Use coupon code off the script for 20% off. And keep an eye out for House of Glory Cutting Corners, my debut episode for House of Glory Wrestling with Matt Travis coming soon, man. HOGWrestling.net and follow House of Glory on Twitter and subscribe to their YouTube channel if you guys want to hear my commentary and see some of the great athletes in House of Glory. Thank you guys so very much. I'm getting out of here. I'll see you guys for part two on Saturday. Until then, enjoy your Fridays. Take care, and I'll see you right back here normal time on Saturday for part two of episode 231. I'll talk to you guys later.